Hello, I'm Paul Stevens, and welcome to our first ever Pitch to Paul investment session, part of our Rockstars 2.0 webinar series. Check out this short video from our series sponsor, Nuki. Was a short video from our Rockstars 2.0 series sponsor Nuki. You can find all of their website details and contact information in the chat. Here is the webinar housekeeping for today. Please, for any questions you have in the chat, a recording will be sent out after the discussion to everyone who registered. Now we're trying a different webinar format today, as you can see. We're channeling the Dragon's Den slash Shark Tank approach. So we'd really love to get your feedback uh, on how we can continue to push new boundaries with our content. Uh, this is me, Paul Stevens, editor of Short Term Rentals, part of the International Hospitality Media Portfolio. And we also have our boutique hotel news and service department news websites. Uh, I'd like to start by introducing our hospitality experts for today, our distinguished panel of investors, uh, advisors, um, and we're going to start with Merrily from Under the Doormat. Merrily, if you'd like to take it away. Hello. Um, <laughs> please introduce yourself. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, is the video on? I just can't actually see anything. Yes, we can definitely see you. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I'm Marilee Carr from Under the Doormat, and I'm also the chairperson of the Short-Term Accommodation Association, uh, which looks after the uh, the professional as well as the platform, platform side, side of, of the short-term short rental, rental industry. industry. Um, sorry, there's sorry, a bit there's a bit back there. Okay. <laughs> we'll come we'll come back and hopefully we can get that sorted for you. Uh, Valentina, please, from Reach UK Second Century Ventures, please introduce Thank yourself. you, Paul. Uh, my name is Valentina Shigoyan. I'm managing partner of Reach UK. Reach UK is a scale-up program for technology startups, real estate technology startups that are at the growth stage. Uh, and Reach UK is fully backed by the venture fund Second Century Ventures in the US. Thank you very much, Valentina. And uh, Matt, take it away. And I'm Matt Hoffman, uh, Managing Partner for Startup Alpha. Uh, we're a technology-focused accelerator, helping early-stage entrepreneurs to start big markets. Thank you very much, Matt. So each startup essentially is going to pitch for around six minutes, and this will lead into roughly 10 minutes um, of Q&A for each startup with our distinguished panel. So please do also post uh, your questions in the chat function, and we'll try and fit those in for you. Um, after the session, our panel will be able to pursue uh, potential investment opportunities with the startups pitching today, if they so wish. And any investors in the audience today, you are also invited to get in touch, contact directly the, uh, the free startups I, I mentioned, um, if you're also interested. So today we have uh, Leo's from Chabatsi, Leon from Pink Tarja, and Francois from Enzo Connect. So, Leos, we're going to start with, with you from Chabaxi. Would like to Hi. Share? <laughs> Would you like to share your screen? Yes, I will. Just a second. And so, do you see me? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, I, I will take it right now. Uh, hi, Paul, and thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. My name is Leo Zamar. I'm the CEO and founder of Chabaxi Accessible Travel Solutions. Um, Travaxi was created from my personal pain. I got injured in the army uh, 20 years ago and immediately I knew that my life is about to change and my needs uh, completely changed. After feeling sorry for myself, I started swimming and uh, rehabilitating myself. Soon I found myself at the, uh, with the Paralympic team. Uh, I am top eight in the world in swimming, uh, represented uh, Israel at the Beijing Paralympic Games. 
But what rehabilitated me more than all was to travel. I spent nearly $200,000 uh, on travel in the first few years, and I didn't get the help I needed to plan and book my trips like any other traveler. So I decided to change that. My solution is an add-on solution, a B2B. There is no need to disconnect from existing uh, connections, flights, and accommodation uh, providers. We are a middle layer solution that makes every online or offline travel agency an accessibility expert. So just for an example, like I said, the problem is that travel agents are not accessibility experts. They don't know to differentiate between different disability types and needs. So for example, a hearing impairment uh, person, and you would say, what does a hearing impairment person need in, in, a, in an hotel or a, any accommodation place? Uh, and for example, a light that indicate a knock on the door so they can see that someone is knocking on the door because they cannot hear it. Uh, an alarm, uh, alarm clock coming from the TV comparing to the regular alarm clock that we all know uh, and use. Uh, TV uh, that you can order room service from the TV comparing to uh, going downstairs and asking uh, the reception to do it because you cannot just pick up the phone. Comparing to uh, wheelchair users such as myself that uh, we need uh, completely different parameters. I need the bed to be in the same uh, height as my knees so I can push myself to the bed. I need to know that I have enough space from the sides of the bed. I need to know that I have a shower chair, grabbing handles and more. The crazy thing about it is America is the most uh, sophisticated in it and they have the ADA, the American Disability Act, but most of the world doesn't have a, a disability act or a law uh, for that. And most places uh, you don't know what you expect when you get them and this is super crucial and sometimes it's ruining the vacation, the holiday. So accessible is great, but for what type of disability, it's very important. As I mentioned, we are a middle layer solution. The, the integration uh, to us is seamlessly, you don't need to disconnect from any provider. Every accommodation place that we have has 90 accessibility parameters and more that we uh, check from the public areas to the room areas and everything needed for all disability types. Uh, it looks like that. So if you integrate our solution to a booking platform, you just uh, integrate the accessibility parameters and the subcategories that we have. The uh, agent, if it's an offline and a traveler, if it's an online, just chooses the type of uh, accessibility parameters that he needs. And we give or tell the system technologically, of course, what hotels to show and we provide uh, the certificate uh, to that specific hotel. We also have airline accessibility notification. Airline requires by law 48 hours in advance to know about travelers with disability types. They also need to know not only the disability type and needs at the airport, but the equipment that they are carrying with. So if I'm coming with a battery, I need to send the documentation to the airline so they uh, will know uh, it can go on the plane. And also if I'm traveling with a blind uh, a person with a dog, for example, then the dog permits, instead of taking two or three hours of an agency to do that, uh, we do it uh, in a simple API call less than a minute. We even have this solution as a SaaS solution. So no integration needed, just a floating button on the on the screen and they use it whenever they need it. We also, uh, because of COVID-19, <laughs> now uh, offer information about uh, the COVID-19 measures that are being uh, taken care of uh, at the accommodation places. We are talking about the biggest and fastest growing minority in the world. There are 1.2 billion people in the world which are disabled, 600 million out of them lives in developed countries. And before COVID-19, 70% of them traveled between two to four times more than the usual traveler, spending $200 billion of travel uh, booking and at destination. We, are, uh, we got the acknowledgement of uh, Amadeus, which is the biggest B2B uh, global distribution system in the world. 50% of world uh, booking uh, goes through their solution. So they uh, topped us as a, a, 
a part of the, their 30 unicorns uh, uh, on their platform, on the Amadeus uh, Startup Universe. Also, we are the winners of World Summit Award 2020. We just won the UN uh, SDGs competition on uh, SDGs 10, reducing uh, inequalities uh, while traveling. Uh, we are at uh, the finals. I just uh, got yesterday news that we're at the finals of the European competition uh, for accessibility. Uh, and we are now integrating companies for a pilot. So we have a Globalia Halcon, which is the biggest travel agency uh, in Spain and Latin America, uh, also the owners of Air Europa. So uh, integrating them for a pilot. Also, uh, we have Flying Carpet uh, Israel, which is the biggest uh, travel agency uh, in Israel, uh, integrating for a pilot. We are looking for uh, $1.5 million. We are looking for $1 million because uh, half of it we can get uh, already from investors they want to come along and also uh, non-equity funds uh, from our country. Uh, we need it basically just to grow our uh, market uh, by uh, uh, amenities, uh, the, the amount of uh, accommodation places that, that, uh, that we have on our system. The airline notification is worldwide. Uh, with the accommodation, we have 16 destinations. We want to grow to uh, 100 destinations so we can be worldwide. And talk to me about our database on the questions. I have a lot of things to say about that. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Leo. It's a fantastic presentation. Um, so we're going to go to our distinguished panel now. And I'd, I'd like to start with Valentina. What, what would... What are your initial thoughts on, on Leo's um, proposition here and, and your thoughts on the presentation? Uh, Leo, thank you very much, first of all, for uh, pre uh, presenting. And uh, there, uh, clearly the product serves great purpose. Um, so uh, kudos for that. Uh, I have a few questions and probably my first question was likely to be in this domain which you wanted to be asked from databases. So how easy is it to get the data uh, beyond the usual suspects, beyond the large hotel brands, and how uh, expensive it becomes. What, uh, how does it affect the unit economics ultimately? Thank you for your question. It's a great question. First of all, uh, the information is super unique and we don't show any accommodation that we didn't check or was checked by us. We have a digital form that knows how to take uh, all this information very simple through the phone or through the computer. It takes around 10 minutes to fill it out. Uh, you can uh, upload pictures over there. Uh, very simple, none, uh, nothing to write uh, or to add. It's everything is already written and just uh, with buttons. The information we started gathering. So now we have a few uh, hundreds of hotel. We have like uh, five or 600 uh, hotels all together but uh, and accommodation places of course but now uh, it's the it's the growing part and uh, we are talking to a, a disabled organization overseas and we're working together with them so we're doing a double purpose we are paying our community to do uh, the check for us but also every one of them will know that there is a Travaxi and even it, that uh, it's a B2B uh, company, they will ask the agent, do you have Travaxi? And if not, they will go to someone that does have it because we take the responsibility. Thank you very much, Joe. And a, a great question there by Valentina. Um, Merrily, you've got experience raising capital with your company under the door mat. So do you have any specific advice uh, for Leo's on the next steps? With Chivaxi. Oh, sorry, we're on mute. <laughs> um, but before, before going into any of my experience, I just want to say congratulations. I think you guys have a great product. Um, it's addressing a very specific market. And I think what's also good is that you've already clarified it's a 200 billion market. So while in, in some ways people might initially think, oh, that's a bit niche, actually you've already addressed that question in, in people's minds very early on. So I think that that's really exciting. Um, I think actually I, I've got a question which will, will come a little bit to some of my advice. You, you talk about the fact that you need this money now and that in two years time that you'll be able to stand on your own two feet. Um, do you plan to have any future raises or do you really just see this raise as a one-off? 
So I'm looking uh, to raise as less as I can because I don't want, first of all, to dilute my uh, investors. I think uh, you have to take it very seriously uh, because uh, a part of it is not uh, to kill the the, um, the spirit of the of the of the venture. And if you uh, in early stage uh, start to give percentage away, you don't control uh, the how you know the um, I'm I'm looking for the world, but the, the how unique it can be and what it's supposed to provide. So I, I don't, I'm not planning to raise more than that because I, I'm, I really think that we can, we, we have all the structure already built. We are not raising to, to, to build this big plan. It's already built and working. Uh, and if we cannot, if we don't need to raise any money, then I prefer not to raise. If we do need to raise money, it would be for a, an AI solution that I want to, uh, to build later on coming together with that solution, uh, suggesting places to other, in other countries. So if I am disabled in a wheelchair, I can suggest uh, similar properties uh, that has uh, similar uh, amenities. And this is something uh, that uh, will be an AI thing that, that we are building, but I don't think that we need more than the money that we're raising. Yeah, um, I think, I guess, coming then back to, to Paul, your question. So I guess the the key thing is going to be thinking about really, if you look out five years ahead, um, and if the product does get the traction that you're looking for, which, you know, it's great, you've got 500 to 600 hotels already on your platform. Um, but getting that supply side up is going to take a lot of resource and effort. Um, and at the same time, the demand side and, and, you know, even though it's B2B and of course, you know, travel agents may share it with each other. You have the community who may drive a little bit of uptake. Um, you're probably going to need resource. You're probably going to need, you know, some additional tech and all these other things. So I think it's just something to think about because often, you know, when I've had investors, you know, asking us questions, they often think about, well, what is your plan? Because if the plan is, well, we'll just raise this money and that's it, we won't need any more. Actually, sometimes they say, well, come on. I mean, if you really want this to be the standard globally, you're going to need more than 1.5 million. Because even if you start getting some revenues in, is that really going to be fast enough for you to get this commercialized as quickly as you'd like it to? And it's almost better to show over time, well, we plan to raise this much in two years, we'll raise this much. So they already understand what that dilution is going to look like. And it doesn't then come as a surprise later on. So that's, it's not to say that you absolutely must do that. Um, but you know, if, if you really want this to be a global standard, you're probably looking at a bit more of VC capital being required to achieve that in reality. Um, and so thinking that through, because in a way, early on as a founder, one of the choices that you have to make is whether you want to keep that ownership, which I get a sense that you do, or whether you want to go for global scalability, because it's really hard to do both. And there are the one in a million uh, cases that it happens, um, but that's just maybe something to, to consider. I, I, I don't want to sound cocky uh, because I'm not, but uh, first of all, thank you for your input. I really look forward not to dilute. I didn't say that we won't raise. Uh, and my stance of uh, saying that I hope it will be the last uh, recruitment is because first of all, we did have uh, one recruitment already. We do have a VC inside uh, uh, that supports uh, elderly uh, housing. And we do have a, a company, uh, online travel agency company from Israel that uh, invested in us as well. So a partner that comes from the industry. And what I did is to go through uh, the UN and the global competitions to get their uh, help uh, connecting to partners. So just an hour before uh, this pitch, I was on the UN uh, meeting and this is exactly what we spoke about. We spoke about the connections between uh, how can we grow our uh, market? How can we speak to bigger investors such as Google uh, and other uh, Qatar Airlines and other big companies to help us with that force? 
um, and not use it as as a capital. Of course, if we if we need it, then we will raise. <laughs> Thank you, Leos. And Matt, I see you um, nodding your head quite a lot there. So have you got a question you would, you'd like to ask Leos? Thank you, Merrily, for the question as well. Yes, absolutely, Merrily. So in the same vein, uh, as Merrily asked the question, you, know, you, you showed on the previous slide, you know, it was 33 to 37% you know, of the 1.5 million you're looking to raise would go towards research and development. So you know, as I'm sort of thinking through, you know, how that money is going to be spent. You know, like she said, you know, they want to know how you're going to deploy that. You know, what's the go-to-market plan? You know, do you, do you know now what the total time to value is? So say from, from actually going and assessing, you know, providing that certificate, what's the cost to provide that certificate? And what's the typical return time uh, of delivery back to your company in terms of revenue? So how long does it take you to, uh, to deliver your service? And then what's the return time? So uh, twenty five dollars per per uh, accommodation place that we that uh, it's if if we don't do it ourselves if we use uh, um, our partners uh, you know the uh, global organizations um, a lot of this money or forty percent of this money can come from a non equity uh, money that uh, I already applied to in Israel. So from our government, uh, I have the Ministry of Tourism in Israel that is very supportive of uh, our uh, uh, venture. You can see it uh, on LinkedIn as well. And trying, trying to get, uh, uh, again, collaborations from our partners, from the UN and our partners, getting into the CEOs of major uh, hotels, major accommodation places and filling the form through their network some of it will be uh, will make it you know money money wise it will be smarter uh, to do it both so yeah yeah thank you and congratulations on the success you just I, I, my feedback would be that you know uh, if you could articulate in a visualization of you know delivering the service you know the value then of that property becoming or, or unit becoming bookable um, you know, or accessible, right? Uh, and then, you know, what then that return time back to uh, to your company would be. I think if that loop was was clear, um, you know, you're off, off to an exciting track here. We are looking for three years time. In three years time, we're supposed to be uh, uh, paying and earning more than we are, uh, you know, spending. So cool. three years time, we will be completely standalone. Uh, company with what we have uh, achieved in Thank you. the first two. Awesome. Thank you very much. That's cool. and, and feedback from our panel there. Um, so I'd like to in introduce our, our second startup and uh, Leo's if you could just take it off the share screen um, we'll introduce uh, Leon Hardgrave from Pink Tarda. Leon? I think we're on mute, Leon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Can you hear me okay? There we are. Sorry. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Can everybody see that? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Paul, uh, for the invitation. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, judges for joining us today. Uh, my name is Leon Hardgrave. I'm the co founder and CEO of Pink Tada. And we were created to save the hotel industry. The hotel industry faces two kinds of problems right now a short term crisis and a long term crisis. In fact, Pink Tada, the platform we built, addresses both. I think the short-term crisis everybody's aware of, um, comprising the same short-term rental space, not as severely though, uh, with revenue having dropped off because of COVID. We have many hotels that are now facing foreclosure, can't make mortgage payments. They're looking for ways to find financing solutions, especially small independent hotels. Our platform actually enables that, and I'll explain how, but it's not actually the reason we exist. We exist to deal with this long-term problem that hoteliers face. It's a structural industry problem where their business is being asphyxiated by two different forces that are, are chewing away at their business model. On one hand, you have the online travel agencies dominated by Booking.com Expedia, who control 70% of the online travel agency market. If you book online, you're probably booking with one of their companies. They charge between 15 and 25% of every hotel room as a fee. It's a huge expense. Uh, they control the cu customers. They, you know, they have the communications. They control the channel. It's very, very difficult for hotels. Uh, it's a big expense, and they don't have connection with the customers. 
While they're dealing with that problem on the other side, you have Airbnb and the other short-term rental companies coming through and chewing away at their customer base by you know, creating hyper-personalized accommodations that really meet people's needs in special ways. I have three kids. Um, so when I go out looking for a place to stay, I can choose between a king room or two queens, or I can go to Airbnb and find something that fits my kids perfectly, or I can stuff them all into a room someplace. And uh, it's a special thing that I can get from them that I can't get from hotels. It's a problem that hotels face now because there's such a high level of expectation from customers. They don't have a way of answering it at this point. We give that them to them. So we think for hotels to be successful in the next decade, they have to do three things. First of all, they have to learn to hedge risk. They have to do what other industries do and pre-sell some future capacity for guaranteed revenue, lock in prices, lock in revenue to make sure if there are disturbances in the future, they're not in this kind of severe situation where they have foreclosures. Second of all, they have to escape the channel trap. They have to find a way of reducing the OTA fees, reducing those costs and gain better connections to their customers. And finally, they have to find a way of matching this customized inventory and diversity of inventory that comes from Airbnb. They need to find an answer that says, we don't just have homogenous, simple sets of rooms. We actually give you something that fits your specific needs as a consumer. The way we're gonna do this with our, our model and our platform is to move the, re the hotel industry from a reservation model to an asset model. What that means is that every single room, night, hotel combination becomes its own distinct asset, a room, night asset. You buy a room for a, for a specific night for a specific hotel, you own that room as a customer. It's basically a ticket to the room. Once you move to that kind of model where customers are no longer making reservations, they actually own the room night for a specific room, it changes the whole dynamic. Hotels are able to sell their rooms up front, get cash, it's off their books. Now me as a customer, I own the room night, but if I have to change my plans, I'm not stuck in the non-cancelable, non-refundable reservation. I can actually go out and trade it on the marketplace. I can sell it back to the market or I can swap it for any other room on the marketplace, any other place, and only, only pay the differential between the two room values. So people are calling this as a result the StubHub for hotels. And if you're familiar with StubHub, it's a ticket marketplace in the US. We're doing the exact same thing. People come in, they bring their, their own information, their own desires, where they want to be in the hotel, what kind of accommodation they're looking for, their own price points. All that comes together into a single marketplace and creates very clear price points for what people want for kind of amenities. This really helps hotels as well because they get price signals immediately about different kinds of accommodations. If I add bunk beds to a room, I put that in searchable now. People see the bunk beds, they come. I pay $20 extra a night because I need bunk beds for my kids. That's a price signal to the hotel that says, hey, this is an amenity that people want. It's something that doesn't exist in the market right now. We give it to them. So here's a mock of what the hotel with the search uh, platform looks like from a consumer perspective. You come in, you get different prices now for every single room. I can book the top floor, the first floor, whatever I want in the hotel. In any hotel, I can actually walk through and look at the different amenities. Let's say I buy a room 104 here because it's the cheapest room. I'm kind of cheap. I come back a couple weeks later. I want to change my reservation. If I have to exit, cancel completely, I can actually sell my room back to the market. In this case, I'd make $17 because prices have gone up. If I just want to change my reservation, I could uh, move to room 304 and pack pocket $18 or I could go to any other hotel and just pay the differential between their hotel values instead of having to cancel and rebook and potentially lose on that transaction. The really cool thing about this is once you start moving to a per room basis, it allows people to really develop a different uh, relationship with the hotel. They can come in, they can actually walk around the hotel, look at it, see all the amenities, find out what the hotel's about, and actually pick the room they want. So if I'm looking for bunk beds, I can search for bunk beds. I can come in here, go walk around the hotel, different hotels and look at actual rooms with specific bunk beds that come up in my search results and find the actual room that fits my needs and fits my family's the kind of room I'm looking for. I'll just get forward here. You can walk through, you can look out the window, you can actually see the whole room. You can basically have a complete relationship with the uh, hotel and know exactly what you're getting. There's no more customer disappointment and I can find the exact room that fits my particular needs. So uh, in summary, the benefits are that uh, for hotels, there's recapitalization financing. We have hotels right now that are having difficulty right now. They're gonna be selling rooms in 2022 and 2023. Small parts of their capacity for cash now allows them to pay their mortgage and they can get through the, this uh, kind of bleak period to the future. They can break the challenge trap. That's been the big, big, biggest excitement from hotels is that they don't have to deal with OTAs anymore or, or they can actually have another channel that competes with OTAs. And we give the hotels all the data from their interactions with customers. They don't get that right off from OTAs. If you want data about the way customers interact with your hotel, you have to pay for it. We give it to them for free. And now hotels can create distinctive rooms and actually sell those and get price signals. For customers, it's even better. They have reservations now with at the same discount price rate they would get for a prepaid non-refundable reservation, but now they have full flexibility. They can change their hotel room up to the last minute and just switch to any other room they want. 
the attribute-based search, which is, which is unavailable in most OTAs, and this then develops a deeper relationship with the hotel. While I catch my breath, uh, thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you very much. An excellent presentation. Um, so coming to our, our panel, uh, Matt, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to you first. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is really intriguing, Leon. A um, couple of questions. Uh, how do you validate proof of purchase? Proof of purchase? Yeah, the booking, right? So like, how, how do you validate that those that are, are putting their rooms uh, you know, into the marketplace have actually booked those rooms? So, so it's so. On one hand, we have the hotels where we onboard the hotels and basically generate the RNAs for them. That's a contractual relationship with the hotel. Okay. They come to their marketplace. They actually do a you know purchase. It's a market. They say, "I purchased this." They they pay for the cash at the time, and then they own that. That's kind of in their. Not, it's not a blockchain thing. But it's in their wallet. It's in their account, and then they have that token. They can actually go back and sell it later, or they can just you know carry it to the hotel and say, uh, "I'm checking in." We actually send. I mean, it's actually not the way it works. We send the information to the hotels usually 40 hours ahead of time. So, That's what I was gonna... so, so we have the ledger of who owns all the rooms. Let's say the hotel gives us 20 rooms. We maintain that ledger of who's in each of the 20 rooms and 40 hours ahead of time, we transfer that to their PMS and then the hotel has the information. So for, from the hotel's perspective operationally, it's much like a tour group showing up and saying, here's the 20 people in your 20 rooms. So what, what happens if there's a booking inside of 48 hours? So we, so we have to suspend trading at a certain point. So we're not exactly sure where that's going to be right now. We don't know if it's going to be 36 or 48 hours, but there will be a point where that's the end of trading. And if you still have the ticket, you either use it or lose it. Okay. And a uh, final question, uh, who owns the customer? Um, Pintado or the hotel? So it, there's two different models, actually. If I go into the product, there's a, there's a product, there's a model where it's just the marketplace and then we own the customer. Um, in fact, in many cases, then the hotel doesn't really even know who the customer is until shortly before check-in when they get the information because it can trade hands. There's a second model where you actually embed the part of the marketplace onto their website. Um, you know, hotels have this issue where it's something like 51% of people that come to their hotel's website to book, then leave and book on an OTA, right? And so the <laughs> hotels are always trying to get people to book on their website and they're losing people even when they get to the website in the first place. So we can create a lot of the immer immersive experience and kind of the upgrade experience on the website. So people come to the website, they can actually look at the hotel, walk around the hotel, and then buy a reservation that's superior for the same price, because of price parity, they can buy the same price reservation for a superior reservation to what's available in an OTA. Over here, you get a non-refundable, non-canceled reservation. Right. You stay on their website, you get one you can swap for any other thing within the marketplace. And so we think that will drive more traffic to the hotel's website. Okay, thank you. Um, Fantina, how, how would you um, assess um, Leon and Victor's presentation there? Thank you, Paul. Uh, extremely interesting. So basically, uh, if I understand correctly, what you're trying to create with Pink Dada is the marketplace for um, hotel room derivatives, effectively. Um, so uh, with, um, with the lack of exchange for this type of rights, you're creating a completely new marketplace as well, for which you will need to um, create or provide liquidity uh, for that to kind of kickstart trading. Do you have an assessment how much capital you will need to have in your pocket to ensure this liquidity that people who come to the market to trade, they actually, they actually make, can make this trade that uh, this market doesn't get stuck and um, been massively illiquid. Um, so how do you solve this and how much capital would you, would you initially need to resolve this issue? Do you have an assessment? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, because we have a marketplace, right, obviously the biggest challenge for us um, and probably the biggest risk point for us is the liquidity issue, right? Do we get both sides to show up at the same time? That's what kills most marketplaces. Um, we've started as a supply-driven marketplace, kind of following the model of most of the, you know, there's some studies out there of marketplaces and there's survivorship bias. If you look at the ones that survived and thrived and have the billion dollar valuations, almost all of them start off as supplier-led marketplaces. And so we've kind of followed that focus. We now have, we're actually signed documents. We have about $10 million worth of supply already. I think by the time we get to say late spring, early summer, we'll probably have something like 50 to $100 million worth of supply stacked up because there is a lot of interest from the hotels. So we feel pretty good about the supply side, but how do we get the people to show up? How do we get the customers to show up for a brand new thing? That's gonna be the biggest challenge for us. Um, as a direct marketing issue, it's a problem because I didn't show you the slide, but if you look at the, the OTAs, the two big ones, Booking and Expedia, they make about 30 billion in revenues. They spend about 10 billion of that on marketing. So they own all those channels. 
it's very difficult to kind of make noise and get people to look at you when they have that much money. Um, we're actually taking kind of a, a specific um, kind of guerrilla route, if you will, to, to doing this. We're actually going to market to a very specific uh, customer base, which is the crypto traders, the Robinhood traders, who tend to like risk, tend to be nomadic, tend to be young, millennial. Um, we think they'll be very uh, they'll be very open to this. And so we're going to hopefully have a relatively small marketing budget in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the initial seed group of people to show up and hopefully take part of this. One great thing about that model is if you get those people involved, if I come in and say, these rooms are so cheap, I'm definitely gonna buy some of these. You know, this is, I think I'm very bullish in travel. I'm gonna buy four weeks of hotel rooms because I think I can sell three weeks of them and then basically a free vacation. Once I go in there and do that and I buy a month of hotel rooms and I become a little speculator, all of a sudden I will now go market to my own network saying, hey, take a look at this thing out here. This is very, a very interesting product. So we think we can actually use a relatively small amount of funding um, to attract that seed group of, of, of basically liquidity providers on the purchase side that will then have their own network effect. But I mean, I, I'll be completely honest, that is a risk point because we've tested the supply side. We've tested product market fit on the supply side. We haven't yet had a chance to test it on the customer side. Thank you, Valentina, for the question. And uh, I'll hand over to Merrily now. Yeah, so I was actually wondering a little bit who is your consumer, because on the one hand, it might be someone who just wants to book a holiday and wants a bit more flexibility. And I'm, if I've understood correctly, you actually sit almost as a white label um, on the hotel websites themselves. So actually, most of your customers might actually be fed in from the hotels, um, people who are booking on those sites. Um, but I actually wonder, your, your comparison to StubHub led me to believe that it might, there might also be a marketplace of spec, uh, speculators. So people who go and buy up lots of hotels um, thinking that they can make money because the prices will go up. Um, yeah. And, you know, is, is there a risk there that that actually backfires and that consumers actually feel like this is, you know, something that, that actually undermines the, the kind of pricing structures within the market? Well, so I'm not sure because I'm not sure the consumers have... Uh, you know, if, if, so, so look, I mean, from my perspective, from a pure consumer perspective, if I show up in an OTA right now, or even the hotel website, I have a choice of two different reservations. Typically I have a cancelable reservation, which is usually full price. And I'm, you know, I'm paying full freight for that. And then I get a prepaid non-refundable reservation, which is maybe a 15% discount about, about, again, we're back to 50%, about 50% of reservations now have moved to that prepaid model. So people are willing to take that small discount and give up all their flexibility. Now there's a whole education process where we have to educate customers about what our model is and how it works. And that's, that's, a, that's an issue. But if you get past that to the point of saying to a customer, why would, for the same price, why would you take a non-refundable reservation that puts you in handcuffs and you cannot change anything? Even, you know, you book something three months out, you can't change anything about your life now. You have to do that reservation three months out versus paying basically the same price on our platform. And now you're getting something where you can change anytime you want. You can go resell to the market or you can swap it for anything else uh, in the marketplace and just pay the basis differential. We think once customers understand that, they'll see this as a superior product. And really, if you distill our core business down to its very basic part, we were replacing the reservation. The hotel reservation, the whole idea of it is something that's existed like 60, for 60 years. It's, it's an ancient idea, which has nothing to do with the networked world. We're saying, look, let's, let's take this relationship and move into a network space where everybody's changing their plans continually. Now in the network space, if you have to change your plan, you can hopefully find somebody else out there who's got an offset and change. You guys can both transact and both of you guys save money and have a, a better experience as a result. So really quick follow on from that. Who actually pays for your product? Is it the hotel? Because obviously if it's the same price as their non-refundable rate, then would actually that be a challenge? Um, or is it the customer who pays to continue to have that flexibility? So, so it's a hotel, but the, the difference is the hotel now, if they sell a non-refundable rate on an online travel agency, they pay, say, 20% to the online travel agency, then they pay a few points to the CRS, and there's a few other middlemen that definitely step, step in and take a couple percentage points out of it. Where if they come through us, we're directly linked to their PMS, they pay 7.5%, that's their only fee, and then it's sold. So it actually cuts, it should cut the fees for the hotels in more than half. We didn't get some additional fees. There are, let's be clear, there are, if there's secondary trading, then there is, a, there is a transaction fee for us. So if you then as a consumer sell to somebody else, you both pay a small transaction fee, which you currently have model is 1%. That's your fee to actually trade in the marketplace. We try to keep that fee as low as possible to encourage as much liquidity as possible. Thank you. Thank you for the questions, Merrily. 
Um, we've got just a bit of time just quickly to answer a, a question from the audience and it's from Patrick Cox. Uh, Leon, what is the benefit to consumers? Right, so the, the main benefit to consumers is that consumers want the cheapest price possible, right? So most consumers end up buying this non-refundable reservation. So we think that going to a consumer and saying, for the same price, you can get a reservation where you do have a little bit of risk. If prices go down, you might lose some money if you have to resell it. But uh, otherwise, you have the ability now to change your reservation, only pay the differential between that reservation cost and any other reservation you want. If you want to change rooms in the hotel, you have somebody else coming with you, now you need a bigger room. It was happening to me several times. I've been on a business trip. Some friend of mine's in town. He's staying in the hotel, you know, two miles away. I would love to just be able to switch over to his hotel and just be in the same hotel with him. But I have to cancel my reservation, rebook, and now prices have gone up. So I'm going to lose, you know, $200 on the transaction. My company will freak out. So I'm not going to do that. In our marketplace, you can do that. You can go basically say, hey, I just want to go swap. I'm going to pay the $15 differential. And now I'm in the other hotel and uh, I'm with the people I want to hang out with. So we just think it gives a lot more flexibility to customers. We do think there's going to be an education process that make customers understand this free optionality they're getting that they basically lost with the existing prepaid reservations. But we think once people understand the optionality and the value of it, people will flock for our product. Thank you very much, Leon. Um, we have to move on to our final startup. Fantastic. Thank you all. Cheers. Questions from our panel again. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, Francois from Enzo Connect. Uh, Francois, I'll take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. There we go. I should be good to go. Can you guys see my screen? Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. So hi, everyone. My name is Francois. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Enzo Connect. This is a brief introduction. I'm not going to dive into the numbers too much. We aren't fundraising just yet, but we'll be uh, next month. So feel free to ask questions after. So how it all started. Uh, in February of 2019, I booked a last minute Airbnb in Montreal, north of uh, Montreal. And when we arrived, the keys were frozen under the doormat. The heating system was very complicated. It was per room and we didn't figure that out until after the checkout. And the host wasn't communicating with us the entire stay. And when we left, the pipes in the kitchen froze and we ended up with dealing with the host and it was a whole mess. And so as part of a course in my undergrad, I had to come up with an entrepreneurial solution. I decided, why not fix this problem? If he had smart devices, this would have never happened. So I built a door and showed that, first of all, keys frozen under the doormat, that is a thing of the past. And uh, we moved forward with sort of this property management software type of tool. But COVID changed everything. The pandemic has changed how people work, live and travel. We're now talking about revenge travel, less work, more leisure, last minute bookings. And what we realized was the opportunity was in communication. Managing a vacation rental home is time consuming. According to Evolve Vacation Rental, it takes about 10 hours per booking per week. Obviously that fluctuates for those that have more uh, better processes, let's say. And we reduce that to a single hour with Airbnb on autopilot where you can save time and increase profits. Now, our vision for the home is very seamless and very safe. We believe in a property's potential to be fully unlocked with smart home devices. And we do that. And, and in our first year, we've been able to prove that with $0 spent on marketing, uh, onboarding about 49,000 plus bookable rooms in 12 different countries, raising half a million dollars during the pandemic and projecting to, to make about on the very low end, a quarter million um, for 2021. Now we do this with an automated experience. That's a digital boarding pass, a one tap unlock solution that connects with different smart locks, as well as a one tap temporary smart home for the guests to be able to control the different devices for the length of their stay. A guest verification portal that gives you a full background check on the individual, as well as party proof solutions with noise order. And a unified messaging system with smart responses and 24 seven Jarvis concierge, Jarvis after Iron Man, because our system is pretty smart. <laughs> Easy onboarding, uh, no more 14 step processes to get on the platform, no more double bookings, and you can leverage your data to know who in your team or yourself is doing well at communicating with your guests. A few additional features, one of my favorite ones, a smart mini bar service you can add to your units where you can add more revenue to, to, your, um, to your bookable rooms by pouring drinks like a mini bar in a hotel, 3D imaging of the home and per night home insurance. Now, why are we doing this? We're doing this because we believe in creating the concept of digital property managers to really bring the concept of vacation rentals on autopilot and allow property managers and hosts to focus on their hospitality business, focus on what brings joy to traveling, happiness, food, exploration, lifestyle, and all of these key words rather than the day-to-day -day communication. Our pricing model is very simple. Uh, for individual hosts, it's free. 
And for more professional hosts, those that have two or more listings, it's a 2% commission. Uh, so 2% per night per listing. Um, now, this is obviously kind of a gross model, but it's to show you the opportunity of what we're trying to do. If we're able to capture about 300,000 listings of just Airbnb and VRBO, that's not even including all the other OTAs, we'd be taking on an average of $3.2 uh, per night per listing. Uh, that's about 40 to, 40 to $50 a month. And that would project us to about 108 million uh, in annual revenue. Obviously, this is purely to show you the opportunity, but we're, we're on our way there. Um, now, how are we doing this? We're taking a bit of a top to bottom approach. Rather than focusing on individual hosts, we're, we're looking at large enterprise scale property management firms that already have technology solutions. And we're combining our guest communication platform within their systems. We then recently merged with BookingPal, doing a, a, an integration with them, allowing us to onboard sort of the more casual, smaller style property managers. And eventually we'd like to have individual Airbnb hosts to use our tools and help manage their, their properties. And the reason we're doing all this and we focus on communication, because if we control communication, we control the entire stack. Now, before I finish off, I just want to jump back on the story of Montagnol and what would have happened if Enzo Connect was involved. So first of all, one tap unlock, no more keys frozen under the doormat. That's a thing of the past. Just hit the button on your key card, just like a boarding pass for your airplane and you're in. Second thing, you get access to all the smart devices from the smart TV to the music systems to the light and especially the heating system. So you have that full smart experience with the unit you're booking. A multilingual virtual concierge, if you're speaking in French, English, Spanish, we know where you're coming from and we can have that more personalized communication, giving you the right recommendations for restaurants and places around through our unified messaging system. No frozen pipes. You can take action once you see that the... Uh, the pipes in the kitchen are frozen or that it's minus 30 degrees in your kitchen, you can not only send a message to your guests, but eventually um, call, a, you know, a call to action and, and call a plumber to, to fix these things. And finally, communicate clean and secure, ensuring profitability and great reviews. So myself, co-founder and CEO, I'm currently finishing off my master's at the University of Cambridge, a master's of entrepreneurship. And my co-founder, uh, Peter Sorbo, who's an undergrad student at the University of Toronto in machine intelligence. Uh, a few awards and recognitions and programs. We recently joined Founders Factory in November. And here are a few awards that we've uh, received over the course of the year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francois. Fantastic presentation there. So um, we're going to go from frozen keys under the doormat to merrily <laughs> under the doormat. <laughs> We rehearsed that one prior to this. So. <laughs> we did so, rehearse that. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. No, um, look, uh, fantastic um, to meet someone else in the market and uh, really great to see the, the products and things that you're looking at. As my first question for you is around um, how you're looking to connect it and who is really your ultimate customer? Uh, because you've talked about, you know, the property managers, guest ready, one fine stay, companies like Under the Doormat. Um, you've also talked about the Airbnb hosts and you've talked about the channel managers like Booking Pal and also affiliate companies like, um, you know, like NoiseAware, which, you know, by the way, those are great guys. So uh, good to see they're, they're partnering with you. Um, but I guess it's unclear for me who it is that you're actually trying to win over to use this technology. Is it those individuals or is it these companies who you think would then use your system? And does it connect to more than, Air more than Airbnb? Because um, that it, it's a very different market for people who just put their property on Airbnb versus people who are really truly multi-channel in terms of where they get their guests from. Absolutely. Um, so I'm actually gonna go back to that slide because I kind of went through it very quickly. Um, but essentially, the way we've seen the the industry, and obviously, correct me if I'm wrong. I know you've got quite a bit of experience in this uh, in this segment. So the way we've seen things is Airbnb hosts eventually become property managers and eventually become hospitality managers, the large, the one fine stay, the host, et cetera. And we want to sort of capture everyone, but we also know that you know with the budgets and and everything that we have, we can't just say that we're going to capture everyone. So in order to achieve that, we sort of have a strategy of focusing on the large enterprise. Uh, ones The ones that already have technology, have built systems inside, are connected to Airbnb and so on. And we natively integrate with their connections with Airbnb, VRBO, and so on. Uh, so that's what we've done with Leaftown, which has provided about 40,000 units to uh, the current numbers that I've shown. Um, but we also want to test out and prove our AI models for our chatbots 
uh, as well as our smart device integrations that feed into that communication tool with the medium-sized property manager. So an example, we just onboarded today, Host Genius, 70 properties in Vancouver. But in order to do that, we needed a channel management solution because we don't have native integrations with those different OTAs. We leverage the large enterprises ones to prove out our model. So in a way, we're becoming a bit of a PMS, but we're not trying to become one. We're just doing it to show that the model works. And eventually what we would like to do is actually white label our systems into existing property management softwares. So that property management software is where people are using, let's say, Guesty for the overall PMS, but then they're using Smart BMB for communication. They can now just use Guesty with our white labeled solution inside them uh, for communication. So our target audience, where we make money, are from large enterprise scale property managers as well as medium scale ones. We eventually would like to have an opportunity for individual hosts to also try out the platform, hence why we have that free model for them. Uh, and the way we're, we're hoping to achieve that is by connecting with the players that already have access to those units and already have access to those customers, such as property management softwares. Uh, but in order to get there, we first need to prove out our model. And that's why we're sort of bridging a bit on the, on the PMS side of things and collecting all of that same information, if you will. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and, and really super quick follow up for just a quick answer. What is what is your charging model? So, you know, are you charging on a per property basis? Are you charging on a percentage of booking revenue? How does how does that work? So it's a per night per listing. So if you make $100 in a single night, we take 2% of that. Uh, and the way we've done it right now, right now we're charging 1.5%, uh, just, you know, for the sake of, of the early stage believers, let's say. Uh, in the case of a white labeled solution, we do have to change our, our pricing model because obviously the, the property management softwares themselves charge three to five. So that it doesn't make sense to give up 2% or like 40% of their revenue to us. So we will look at a different way to, to onboard that side of the equation, if you will. Uh, but for now, we need to prove out the models of our systems working, you know, in an efficient way for individual hosts, property managers and large scale, large scale enterprise solutions. Brilliant. Love it. Um, I, I'll probably have Richard, our, our COO, get in touch so that we can learn a little bit more um, from a Hospiria point of view. 100%. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marilee. Uh, Matt, we'll come, we'll come to you next. Uh, so, Francois, uh, how many units uh, would you say categorizes large-scale property management? So I, I don't categorize it based on units. I categorize it based on the technology that they build. Um, Airbnb host they are confused by the fragmentation in the industry. There's too many PMSs, too many softwares out there that are supposed to help them save time. Uh, property managers have figured out what kind of works for them. And hospitality managers, according to the slide, are the people who went out and raised money to build their own solutions because those things didn't work for them. So I don't necessarily categorize by number of units because we've seen hospitality managers like Oasis Collection that have 1,300 units. And then we see Vacasas that have way more. So it's very different uh, for, for everyone. Um, but I would say somewhere around more than a thousand units is where I sort of push towards hospitality manager. And that's where we usually see them start building technologies. Um, the reason we've dived into this space and, and we've approached it this way is because it's sort of a stay in your lane mentality. Uh, and, and I don't mean it in an offensive or arrogant way, but it's for property managers, we want them to do and, and be what they're best at, which is hospitality managers. They're great at creating that sense of hospitality. But when it comes to building tech, I've seen it all. Um, you know, we're not talking about serverless infrastructures. We're talking about AI, big quotation mark. Uh, and we're usually talking about just acquisition of old property management softwares with a new design. Um, whereas uh, on, the, on the software side, we sort of know what we're doing and that's sort of the approach of, of targeting those large scale enterprise solution that have tried building uh, software and with COVID-19 have realized we can't deploy the same cash into building technology anymore because we're not getting enough cash from a booking side of things. So we're coming in and building those sort of custom integrations for them. Okay. Um, so much longer answer than needed, by the way. No, I apologize. It's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> so um, to, you know, to share some, just some food for thought, uh, but Large scale, you know, and thinking and kind of targeting, you know, the hospitality managers, you know, that also comes with, you know, a very high OPEX, right? You, it's very expensive to be able to pursue those customers. It's a smaller number that would really kind of fit, you know, that category. Um, furthermore, you know, they're typically very uh, mindful of margin compression. And you're looking at, you know, a solution that, 
you want to be able to uh, you know white label into their existing PMS, um, and you know that that can come with some challenges too because you typically then are are stuck in a, a loop where you're sort of building maybe one-off features uh, to support that larger customer as opposed to you know maybe further downstream where um, they quite maybe haven't reached that threshold yet. Um, and then you mentioned that you're controlling the communication. You know, you control the entire booking. You know, I would also just think through. Um, you know, typically it's the it's the availability, uh, but the communication piece and helping them facilitate that. Do you are, are you looking for uh, prerequisites for inventory that they already have automation inside of the home to be able to use the technology that you're talking about to control all the devices? No, not even. And so this is a great question because we were asked this a year ago. Uh, when we first started, who is going to purchase these devices? Are you the one giving them out and so on? Now, we've developed partnership with the different device companies to provide discounts and have sort of a rev share model on those devices and so on. But COVID-19 has just accelerated the onboarding of those devices. Uh, I'm French and French people, you know, very slow with adopting smart locks. When I was talking to a few companies last year, they were like, no, our hospitality thing is meeting in person and so on. Well, I can tell you the ones that survived COVID-19 are the ones that adopted smart technology such as smart locks because no one wants to meet them in person anymore. So those companies are actually acquiring those devices. We don't really need to do it. We just need to connect with the right devices, the ones they've decided. And eventually, I hope we can have a say on which ones they should pick once we've established those sort of partnerships. Um, and our software right now, the value that we've seen from our large customer uh, has been actually primarily on the communication side of things. And that's because deploying those smart devices in all of those rooms, whether hotels, you know, resorts and so on, is a very time consuming endeavor. Uh, so at this stage, their biggest pain point was unifying all of the messaging from the different OTAs, which is something that you can see in different property management softwares, but none of them have a serverless infrastructure, which allows you to do that on 40,000 listings instantly, search a booking, search a, a message uh, and so on. So that was sort of the, the initial, you know, getting into this, uh, this play. And now it's building out the different integrations and feeding that communication pipeline of check-in, check-up, check-out with the different devices. Um, yeah. Thank you, Matt, for the question. Um, I'll just come to Valentina so you can get one more question just in the last. Sure it will be really quick, just building on uh, Matt's question. So how many, uh, what are the percentage of properties that have uh, smart devices installed uh, out of all of them uh, on Airbnb platform? So what is your then part, part of the market that you're addressing? It, it, it's not a number I'd be comfortable sharing because I don't have the actual number. And it really differs between Airbnb units versus uh, hotel units. Right now, we've targeted sort of, we're, we're still trying to find our niche. And so we've got units that are hotels. We've got units that are Airbnb homes, uh, apartments, condos. And it depends on each case. Condos, for example, can't retrofit smart locks but they can't put a smart noise sensor. A hotel to change their key access control, very different. Uh, and then some houses, they do have, you know, the new key, for example, as per the sponsor of this, um, of this show, uh, August and, and all of the other devices. So I can't unfortunately give you an exact uh, percentage, um, but we have seen an increase in adapting that kind of, uh, adopting that kind of technology because of COVID-19, where people do want touchless and seamless access management. Uh, so, yeah, I, I can review this and, and, and get you the exact number, hopefully, in the next couple of days. Thank you very much, Francois. Fantastic presentation there. And uh, to all of our startups, they're really great job today, and uh, especially with this new format that we've created. So we'll just come to our next slide. So I hope that um, everyone uh, agrees that we've got some fantastic takeaways from today's event. And I'd urge you as well to please contact our panel of investors, advisors, and of course our free startups if you'd like to pursue um, other opportunities for investment after this. And of course, any feedback on the session is always welcome. Uh, so thank you again to all of our, our startups pitching, to Leo's, to Leon Francois, and to our distinguished panel of advisors and investors, Merrily, Valentina, and Matt. And we're very excited about our upcoming Shorties Awards for the global short-term rental industry. And the deadline for submitting entries closes this Friday, the 5th of March at 23.59 GMT. So don't delay submitting your entry. The Shorties Awards take place virtually on Thursday, the 22nd of April, 2021. Now the ceremony is going to be free to attend. We've got a few surprises lined up. So we're very excited to welcome everyone along to that. 
Um, and I'd also encourage you to sign up to our Urban Living Light series, webinar series sponsored by Yardi. It's a series of eight bespoke virtual events that are free to attend in the run up to our Urban Living Festival on 7th and 8th of July 2021. We've already had two fantastic days uh, of sessions already. And as you can see, there's some very topical um, sessions still to come, sustainability, mixed use. So I really hope you'll all uh, check that out and all the details are in the chat for you. Uh, for sponsorship opportunities, please do get in touch with my colleague Katie and her details are on the screen for you now. And a big shout out, of course, to our series sponsor, Nuki. Uh, very much appreciated and their details again in the chat for you. And of course, feel free to contact us by our various channels, newsletters. Uh, so all that's left for me to say again is thank you again for listening and for taking part. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.